Facebook, and you may have uh, the folks of out in the parking lot listening on the uh, radio transmitter. So, uh, welcome. Good to have everyone join us. A little bit different uh, this morning. Uh, we had a large crowd uh, last Sunday. Uh, and, uh, it's a little off this Sunday, just a little. But, uh, anyway, uh, we did, you know, have as you those that get the one call. Have an individual test uh, positive for COVID that was here last Sunday, so we just felt that it may be better to uh, forego the meeting in person for this Sunday. Next Sunday, just kind of maybe give people a peace of mind. Uh, but hopefully, if everything works out, uh, two weeks from today, we will be back to having Sunday school at 10 15 and worship at 11. So, anyway, uh, glad to have Jay back this morning. Family on their return safely, and hopefully they're well rested in their uh, time off. Uh, prayer request this morning. Uh, I don't know of any in particular uh, that we need to remember. Uh, remember the ones that have been affected by the virus. Uh, you know, here in our own uh, congregation and uh, any uh, all the others. So we will open with a word of prayer, and then uh, Jay will come and bring the word. Dear gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you once again that we are able to come together, Lord, uh, by virtue of uh, the radio transmitter and uh, Facebook Live, Lord, that you have provided us these means and methods uh, to still get the word out, Lord, and we thank you for this. suffering from the virus at this time, those that have lost loved ones to it, uh, the others, Lord, that may have lost loved ones to other uh, diseases and, and sickness and illnesses. Uh, Lord, we just continue to pray for uh, leadership and, and guidance, Lord, and uh, just help us, Lord, to hold to you during these times. You are in control in, in the situation that is in your hands. Lord, we just pray for Jay this morning as he brings the word. Uh, use him, Lord. Speak through him. Uh, let us see you and not him, Lord, that he may bring your word to us and apply it to our hearts and our lives and our walk with you. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins, uh, the ones that we knowingly commit and the ones that we do not know. church and the 
people here. Uh, we continue praying for you all. And so uh, I love you guys, and I, I really appreciate everything you've done for us. So, again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Now, two weeks ago, I have to think about it, two weeks ago, we had started chapter 9 of Hebrews. And in chapter 9 of Hebrews, we were seeing uh, the, the comparison of the Old Testament, uh, the Old Covenant, and the New Covenant. And so what you're seeing here is the writer of Hebrews puts up the, the two covenants together to show you the, uh, the weakness of the first covenant. Now the first covenant was not a bad covenant. It was something that God had, had created that was between uh, him and the Israelites and for the purpose of pointing us to something greater, to something greater. So think about that. He, the writer of Hebrews is constantly telling the people, look, do not hold to the things of the past. Do not hold to the picture or the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the antitype. No, maybe I got that right. No, I'm wrong. I, I, I'm, I'm going to disregard that antitype type. I, I, I forget about that every once in a while, what the, the two differences are. But anyways... It's the picture, the picture of things that happened in the past uh, that was pointing to something that was going to take place in the future. And they were saying, look, you need to keep looking to the future, to the thing that is getting ready to happen, the covenant that's getting ready to happen, this new covenant that God has given to you in Jeremiah 31, 31, where he explains how he's going to take the Israelites and he's going to put his spirit within them and he's going to remove this heart of stone that they have and give them a heart of flesh and he's going to write his laws on their heart and he's going to give them a new spirit and he's going to put his spirit inside of them so that they can walk in the covenant so that they can do the law right now they have no ability to do the law because of the old covenant is just pointing to something it doesn't it doesn't clean you from the inside. It may clean the outside, but it's not cleaning you whole. It's not cleaning the inside. It's not cleaning your conscience. So the old covenant was weak. But what the old covenant did was it pointed to Christ. What it was doing was pointing to Christ. And it was saying to you and to the Israelites and to everybody... That you are unable, you are unable to keep the law. And it was showing us our, our, our fault. It was showing our sins. And it was pointing the finger and saying you are unable to keep the law. But God being rich in his mercy, but God being rich in, in his grace, he poured out his grace upon us. And through the covenant of the Israelites uh, with him, he, this new covenant that he has made with the Israelites, we, the Gentiles, benefit. We, we benefit from it. The, 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 the Israelites have rejected the new covenant. And then it goes out to the, to the Gentile world. And we receive the benefits. We receive the benefits of this covenant. And it's through Christ Jesus, our mediator. It's through Christ Jesus, our high priest, who has gone before us. And he has died in our place. He has lived the life that we were supposed to live. He has followed every single law that God has laid out. He has fulfilled every law. And then he died on our behalf so that we can have eternal life with God the Father. He is our mediator. He is the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice. He has redeemed us. And through his blood, he has washed us clean. And now we can stand, as Paul says in Ephesians, uh, that we can stand with God. Him and, and, and with God and, and be in fellowship with God and love God and, 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 and be with Him forever, holy and blameless. 
That is, that is the goal. That is what we need. Because God is life. It's not that just He has life. He is life. And in order to have everlasting life, you have to have fellowship with that one who has life. And the only way that was done, that it was done, was through Jesus Christ, who was our mediator. Now, we pick up in chapter 9, verse 15, and it says, For this reason, Christ, he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that, here's the purpose, since a death has taken place for the redemption of the transgressions that were committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now, the eternal inheritance is something that God uh, made a covenant with Abraham. He's made a covenant with Abraham a long time ago, before, before the Israelites were even uh, uh, born. Before the, the nation of Israel was even created, God made a covenant with Abraham. And he told him everything that he's going to give him. And then he made a covenant with the Israelites 400 and some odd years later. And he says to them, you follow the, the, the law, you, you keep my commandments, and you will have the inheritance. But the problem is, they couldn't. No one can keep the law. Right? This is the first covenant. And so there's a problem there, because they can't keep it. So they have to have somebody come in as a mediator, somebody who redeems them, pays the price for their sins, and also cleans them in order to have this eternal promise, this inheritance that was given to Abraham. So it says, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now, it says, for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of one who made it. Okay? And now we've talked about covenants. We, we talked about how uh, two people usually came together and how they would they would uh, uh, cut the animals in half and they would put them one half on one altar and one half on the other altar and then they would walk in between this, the, the two animals or the, the two altars with the animals on it as the blood is coming down into the middle and they would walk through and they would say to themselves, if I break this covenant, it is my life that my blood that will be spilled. And so that's how they keep the covenant Flowing. That's how they keep it going. Two uh, families, two tribes coming together. And if the covenant is broken, a death has to be made in order for that relationship to keep going. A price has to be paid in order for that relationship to keep going. Now it says here that, that where a covenant is, there it must of necessity be the death of one who made it. Now, a lot of preachers uh, uh, believe that this covenant here is, um, is something like a will. But it, it's hard to, I, I don't look at it that way. Uh, because I look at the covenant as the covenant and not so much a will. Because what happens in a will is somebody dies, right? In a will, he writes his will and he says, uh, such and such is going to get this amount of money and this amount of land. And so what happens is he dies, and then uh, they open up the will, and they say such and such. You have this amount of money, of his money, and this amount of his land. And that's pretty much all that's done. You, the, the person dies, and, and, and the, 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 the receiver of, the, of all the material that this guy had receives it. But see here that the, the person had to die in order for the will to take place, in order for the will to go into motion, so to speak. But see, uh, on a covenant, there is a, uh, when, when, when two people come together, when two tribes come together, two fathers come together, everything is fine. The covenant is, is still there. Uh, 
that the people have a relationship with one another, everything is fine, everything is hunky-dory, and until somebody breaks the covenant, breaks a promise, or breaks the, uh, the law of the covenant, now the covenant goes into effect. And the covenant says, you must die in order for this relationship to take place. So in other words, everything's happy, everybody's happy, and the covenant's still there, the covenant is, is still there, it's not in motion, but everything's happy until somebody breaks it, and then all of a sudden the covenant goes into motion. And it says, this is what has to happen in order for these people to come, keep together, in order for these two families to stay together. Now, the covenant was fine until somebody broke it. And when we break it, we've broken the covenant. Uh, man has broken the covenant. So now there is a, there's something that needs to take place. A death needs to take place in order for uh, our relationship with God to remain whole. And it says here, for where a covenant is, there must of necessity be the death of the one who made it. Now here's the thing, uh, you know, man made a covenant, or God made a covenant with man. Let's put it that way. Man didn't come and say, I, I bargained with you, God, and I'll take this much, and I'll give you this much. No, the covenant was, God comes, and he lays down his laws, and he says, I'm making a covenant with you, and uh, you keep my laws, and I will give you the inheritance. Problem is, we've broken the law. We break the covenant. And so somebody has to come and pay that price. Well, God didn't break it. So God is, is not, uh, it, it, God doesn't die. And number one, God cannot die. So God cannot die. And God it, did not break the covenant, so it's not his fault. It's our fault. It's man's fault. But here's the thing. Our God is gracious. Our God is merciful. He's compassionate. He's kind. He's loving. And He loves us. So He sent His only Son, His only begotten Son, to take on flesh and to live for us. To follow the law for us. And then He was to die in our place. He was to die for man. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the substitution of, of God sending His Son, His Son taking on flesh on our behalf and living a life that we could not live and then dying a death that would redeem us, that would pay the price we deserve the death. We deserve the death. And we need that mediator. We need that one to come for us and die on our behalf and pay the price so that we can keep this fellowship with God, so that we can keep this relationship with God. That's the gospel. And that's it. He says here, uh, for a covenant, in verse 17, is valid only when men are dead. The covenant only goes into effect. It's only stronger when somebody has to die. And he says, for it is never in force, it's never in force, while the one who made it lives. Therefore, even the first covenant was not inaugurated without blood. The first covenant was inaugurated with blood. And he explains, he explains to the Hebrews what happened. For when every commandment had been spoken by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water and scarlet, wool, and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people saying, This is the blood of the covenant which God commanded you. 
And in the same way, he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with the blood. So what he's saying here is that this, this covenant that's taking place, it has to be done with blood. In other words, there has to be a covenant that's done with blood. It's a blood covenant. And so the, the blood of calves and goats were, 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 were mixed with water, and they were sprinkled upon the people, and they were saying, this is the covenant. If I break this covenant, it's my blood. Well, God didn't break the covenant. The people did. The people did. And so it's their blood. Their blood has to be spilled. But what we see here, and this is the beauty of it, is that we see the blood of cattle and goats mixed with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people. Again, this is a picture of what was to come. This sprinkling was a picture of something that was to come. Because it was Christ's blood who redeemed us. It was Christ's blood who redeemed a people to God, purchased by God through the blood of Christ. And it was forgiveness. It was the picture of forgiveness. The, the blood is a picture of forgiveness. But what you see here with, mixed with that blood is water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both on the book itself and all the people. So what you see here is a cleansing. So you've got the forgiveness of sins through the death of one, and along with the forgiveness of sin, you have a cleansing that takes place. <coughs> there is a cleansing that takes place, and that only comes through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ on the cross you see him on the cross, and he gives up the spirit. And then the the the, uh, uh, the Roman guard comes over, the centurion comes over, and, and stabs him into the rib in, in the rib with a, a spear. And out comes what? Blood and water. Again, it's a picture of the forgiveness of sin and the cleansing. The cleansing to be holy and blameless before God. This is done by Him. It's the sprinkling. He is the Word. You are clean by the Word. So it's Him and Him only that can do this. He's the only one that can do this. He's the only one that can, to, that can sacrifice Himself. And it's His blood that pays the price for our sins. For our falling away, for our breaking of the covenant, and not only that, it's his the water of the word of the, the the word the water of the word is 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 cleansing us. We go to Ezekiel, Ezekiel thirty six, and I keep going back to this, and I'll keep going back to this until you get it, <laughs> until we all get it. But here's the thing, he says I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. This is God speaking to the Israelites. He says, which has been, uh, I, I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. The nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the Lord God, when I prove myself holy among you in their sight. For I will take you from the nations, gather you from all lands, and bring you into your own land. And here it is. And I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I, moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. You will live in the land that I gave to your fathers, your forefathers, 
So you will be my people and I will be your God. Do you see that? There's a cleansing that takes place. There is a price that needs to be paid. And that is with Christ's blood. And there is a cleansing that needs to be taken place. And that is through Christ. Christ is the only thing, the only one that can cleanse us from our unrighteousness. He's, he is righteousness. And he is the only one that can cleanse us. We see this in Leviticus, uh, Leviticus uh, 14, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. And so in verse 4, he says, Then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string. This is a, uh, a, a, a wool. This is, again, this is what we're seeing in Hebrews. We're seeing uh, water. We're seeing wool. We're seeing this scarlet wool. And we're seeing a cedar wood. But here he says, the, Then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop. There it is again, the hyssop. For the one who, had, who is to be cleansed. Okay, so when the, when, the, when the Hebrews saw this word hyssop, when the Hebrews saw the, the scarlet string and they saw this cedar wood, but uh, they see this hyssop and the cleansing, that's, all, that's the first thing that comes to their mind is this cleansing. We're talking about a leper here. A leper, uh, in, in the future, you, you see that the leper basically is pointing to something uh, greater. It is pointing to our sin. Okay, the leper is pointing to our sin and death. Back then, a leper, there was nothing you could do for leprosy. And when you got leprosy, it was death. It was a death sentence. And so this picture here is that you, are, you have leprosy and it, and it is a picture of your sin eating away at you. And so there's a cleansing that takes place. Um, then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet string and hyssop for the one who is to be cleansed. The priest shall uh, also give orders to slay one bird in the earthenware vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and the hyssop and shall dip them and the live bird in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. So you got this bird that has been, the, the neck has been ringed Rung, ring, and um, and the blood is dripping into this running water, into a bowl. And he's taking this hyssop and this string, and it's just, and they and they dip this hyssop and this string, this this wool, this scarlet wool, and then they, you dip the bird as well, and that bird was dipped in this blood and water, and and so he shall then sprinkle seven times the one. Who, he is to, who is to be cleansed from the leprosy and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the live bird go free over the open field. So you think about it. Think about this. So what's happening here is what I've said before about the scapegoat. You've got the one picture here is, is the bird that, that's being killed and the cleansing um, that is happening, taking, taking place because this bird is being killed and the blood is being mixed with the water and you sprinkle the one who is being who has the leprosy, the one who has the sin, the one who, who has offended God has been cleansed by the blood. And then this other, this other goat or this other bird was to show that the, the blood was poured onto this bird and he was dipped into this blood and then he was let go. And that's showing that his sins are, are forever gone. His sins are gone. The scapegoat walked out. They took the scapegoat out of the camp and into the wilderness. And, and all the sins of the, of the Israelites were placed upon this, this goat. 
And they were sent out into the wood to show that the sins were gone. And this one has been cleansed. But that's what they, when they hear this, when they hear about his, they hear about the Passover. Let's talk about the Passover. What was the difference between an, an Egyptian and an Israelite? When well, none. They both were sinners. Here's the difference. The ones who had the blood on the doorpost uh, that was spread with hyssop, the ones who had the, the blood spread on the doorpost with this hyssop were passed over. The judgment did not come to them. There was no difference between the Israelite and the Egyptian. If the Israelite had not put the blood on the doorpost, the firstborn of that family would die. So you see that there's no difference. It's all about Jesus Christ. It's all about His blood. It's all about His blood that, that, that God passes over us and judgment doesn't come to us because we are covered in the blood. We are, we are washed clean by the Word of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ being the Word of God. This is, this is what we see in the Old Testament is, is pointing to something greater. And the writer of Hebrews is, is showing us. He's pointing it out. He's, he completely goes over it over again and again. And he's saying, look, look at the hyssop, the, the washing, the cleansing, everything was pointing to something greater. And that something is Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. He has paid the price with his blood and he has cleansed us. It says here in verse, uh, verse 21, And in the same way he sprinkled both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry with blood. Verse 22, And according to the law, one may almost say, all things are cleansed with blood. Now, the reason why he said almost all, because if you were poor, if you were like super, super poor and you couldn't afford animals, you could bring fine flour and, 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 and a person could be cleansed or forgiven of their sin if they brought an, an ephah of, of fine flour. If they couldn't afford birds or a goat or a lamb. So that's why he says here, and according to the law, and one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And that's what he's saying here. The, 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 the atonement was always done with blood. It was always a sacrifice. There was always a sacrifice that had to be made. And if you were poor, 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 then you could bring an ephah of a fine flour. And that's the only reason. And he says here, all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There's no forgiveness with, without the shedding of the blood. He says, therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the things in heaven to be cleansed with these. But the heavenly things themselves with a better sacrifice than these. See, the blood of bulls and goats could not uh, enter into heaven and cleanse and, and forgive. The blood of bulls and goats could not do that. All I did was take care of your outside. All I did was take care of the cleansing from the outside. Because you walk out of the temple and five minutes later, you need another sacrifice. You need another sacrifice because you, you've sinned. You've probably thought something wrong. And so, you know, every day we needed a sacrifice. Every day the Israelites needed a sacrifice. They needed a sacrifice. It was always showing them that, 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 that their sins were upon them. The whole point of that was to show that they were sinners. And they needed a sacrifice for their sins, a cleansing that blood of bulls and goats could not do. But here's the great thing. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't go into heaven, right? But we have someone who sacrificed himself and is much greater than the blood of bulls and goats. He's much greater than all that sacrifice. 
He sacrificed himself once, once for all, and he entered into the Holy of Holies that was not made by hands, that, that, that is in the heavenly places, and he goes before God with his blood. And that is, it, and that allows us, it enables us to, to be forgiven of our sins through his blood. And it says, for Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. That's why we need a mediator. He was that high priest that came on our behalf, that died on our behalf, that lived the life on our behalf, and entered into heaven on our behalf. Why? So that we can enter into heaven. So that we can follow him and have fellowship with God the Father with him in heaven and always. And everywhere. Praise God for Jesus Christ. If it wasn't for him, we would be nowhere. We would be separated from God eternally and damned forever. But praise God that he did this for us, is what it says. Nor was it that he would offer himself often. You know, here's the thing. As, as the high priest enters the holy place year by year with blood, that is not his own. Otherwise, he would have needed to suffer often since the foundation of the world. But now, once, at the consummation of the ages, he has been manifested to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Now, I want you to get this. Jesus Christ did not have to constantly die. This is how great his sacrifice is. He does it once. Once only. For the whole of the time, the, the consummation of the ages. From before the cross until after the cross. For all the time, he has died once and paid the penalty forever. He doesn't have to die over and over and over and over again like the blood of bulls and goats. If you are forgiven of your sins by Jesus Christ and, and his death and, and burial and resurrection and you have fellowship with God, you are forgiven forever. And that's something to be excited about. Your sins are remembered no more. You have you've been clean, you have been washed, and God sees you as holy and righteous and blameless. And that's the only way to have salvation. That's the only way to have a, a fellowship with God, to be called blameless and righteous, is to have it through Jesus Christ and Him alone. That's the only way. And it says in verse 27, And inasmuch, as he is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes the judgment. So Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin, to those who eagerly await him. Now, I love this verse. I really, really love this verse. Because what it's saying here is that I have been, been forgiven. That Christ died once for all. He died once. He offered up himself once. And, and, and that was it. That's all that needed to be done. And it is appointed for men to die. Christ was appointed to die. And then comes the judgment. But the judgment that he had was he is, he is righteous. He is holy. He is deserving of all things. Because he is sinless. And those who are in Christ Jesus are righteous and holy and blameless and have all authority given to them as well. Because only, only because we are in Christ Jesus and that is it. That's it. 
That's our righteousness. He is our righteousness. He is our forgiveness of sins. He is our, our, our uh, where we stand before God blameless. It's because of Him. Now here's the great thing. And here's the great thing. He's coming back. This is the great thing. This is what every believer looks forward to. Him coming back. Because here's the thing. He's not coming back to His people to judge His people. That's already been done on the cross. Through Him. And those who believe in Him are in Him. That is not a, a, a reference to sin is what it says. There's, he's not coming back in, in, in reference to sin. He's coming back for salvation. To save us from these bodies. To give us new bodies. Bodies that are, that are not uh, full of pain and suffering and, and sin and, 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 and uh, sickness. He's given us holy bodies. Brand new bodies. And I can't wait for that. I, I, I was fishing uh, all day, standing up on my feet, and, and, I, and I walk into the house and my legs were killing me. My feet were killing me. My hips were killing me. My back was killing me. All I wanted to do was lay down. I mean, I had a great time fishing. That was awesome. But the payment that I had afterwards, that wasn't so great. I felt it. I'm still feeling it. I've got chapped lips. I've got skin that's burnt and, and peeling. So my body hurts. But I, 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 I promise you, people, I promise you, through God's Word, it says here that He is coming back for the final salvation plan. He has saved us from our sins. He has bought us. And now He's coming to give us our body. Our eternal body. And I can't wait. I cannot wait. I eagerly, eagerly, eagerly wait. Then. Because He's not coming back to judge those who love Him. He's coming back to judge those who have sinned against Him and who have railed against Him and don't want to have anything to do with Him. He's bringing judgment upon those people, but for His people, He's bringing salvation. Where we no longer have a separation uh, between God. We can see Him face to face. We can fellowship with Him as... as, as, as and, and, and I love the way the Bible says it. That he knows us and we'll know him as he knows us. We'll see him as he sees us. I look forward to that day when there's nothing hindering my view from God. I eagerly, eagerly await him for that day. You think there's problems here on the earth? You think there's problems here on the earth now? Well, there is. There's a lot of problems on the earth. There's there's dissension. There's there's uh, there's war. There's there's uh, famine. There is sickness. There is hatred. But when he comes back, that will all disappear. That will all go away. And I can't wait for that. Imagine living in a world like that. Where we fellowship with God face to face and we have no, no pain, no suffering, no, no war. I, I want that. And every believer should want that. Because he comes a second time for salvation without reference to sin. To those who eagerly await him. Turn real quick. 1 Corinthians 1.7 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 7. And jump up to uh, jump up to 6. Even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly 
the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We are waiting eagerly. We are waiting eagerly so that we can be confirmed to the very end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I look forward to that. You want to see another one? Titus 2.13. Titus 2.13. It says, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good works. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. See, these are things we need to be speaking to one another about. These are things we need to be exhorting one another about, pushing uh, one another about, reproving one another. We need to do this as believers, uh, helping one another to encourage one another to say, look, he has redeemed us. He has, he has redeemed us with his blood and he has washed us clean. He has purified a people for himself. And the writer of Hebrews the writer of Hebrews is, is crying out to them and saying, look, put all that stuff aside. And throw that stuff away. Cut yourself away from it. Because all of that stuff was pointing to what has already come in Jesus Christ. You want to be purified? It's Jesus Christ. You want to be saved? It's Jesus Christ. You want to be a redeemed people? It's Jesus Christ. All of this is done through Him and Him alone. Everything, everything was pointing to Him. Everything. The, the old covenant was weak. It was earthly. It could not clean you. The new covenant is heavenly, not made with hands. It's something that's done for you. And it's something to clean you eternally, inside and out. Trust in Jesus Christ. Hold fast to Him. He is our faith. He is our hope. He is everything that we need. Hold fast to Him. Persevere to the very end, holding fast. He is our new covenant. Praise God. Father in heaven, I thank you that you have found fit to send your Son to take on flesh, to pay our price, to live for us, and to rise again so that we can have life with you forever and ever. This is our desire. He is what we need every single day. Hold fasting to Him. Hold fast and persevering to Him. Holding Him to the very end. And Father, we look forward to the day when you come back. When you come back and, and you, you bring with you life for our dead bodies. Father, I look forward to that. 
And I pray that every believer looks forward to that as well. Looks forward to you coming. That we, we look forward to you coming and not be ashamed of what we're doing and how we're living. But that we, we continue to live for you. We continue to do what you want us to do. That we're zealous for you and for your law. That's, that's what we desire. So Father, I pray that we will be a people that lift one another up, encourage one another, and exhort one another, and reprove one another to, to hold fast to you, to look to you in all things, to know that you have paid our price, and not to look to the old, not to look to tradition, or to this church, or to these pews, or to anything that we think is holy. But Father, that we look to the only one who is holy, and that is Jesus Christ. And we hold fast to him. Father, if there are people that, that need you, save them. Bring them here. Let them know that they are loved. Father, we, we ask that you touch every heart that hears this word. And, and to every believer that we have assurance and, and, and we have more faith in you and what you've done. Lord, that we know your word, that we know everything about you. Because knowing you and knowing your son is eternal life. So Father, as a people, let us know you more and create in us a faith that is beyond what we have now, that we hold fast to you forever. We love you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. All right. Well, Sandy Branch, I'm happy to be back. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to be in God's Word. Uh, I hope that you are too. I'm, I'm grateful uh, for uh, for last week. It really it, it does my heart good to see uh, the next generation uh, picking up the, the torch and moving on. And so uh, that's a good thing. It's a good thing. And so uh, I think all churches should be doing that, raising up children to be able to stand in this pulpit and proclaim God's Word. And so I think that's an awesome thing. Uh, I think we need to be doing more of it. But uh, uh, as a people here, St. Bridge, I truly love you. Uh, you are a, a gracious people to me and my family, and we, we uh, thoroughly enjoy being here. And so uh, with that, I will say that next week we will be meeting again here on Facebook. And, um, and then the following week, after next week, two weeks from now, we will be meeting back here, uh, hopefully. Uh, we'll let you know. Uh, but I think we will be meeting back here. Um, I'm, I'm praying that we do. And it's always encouraging to see faces. <laughs> it's always encouraging to see people in, in, these, in these pews. Okay? So, um, again, pray for one another. Love one another, take care of one another, and most of all, go out and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you, okay? And what he's done for them, for, for the world. Go out, Sandy Branch, into the world and proclaim the gospel, teaching them everything that he has taught us. And he says to baptize them in the name of the, the Father, Son, and the Spirit. And he says that he is with us always, even until the end of the age. So have faith and courage in that, and go out and proclaim what he's told us to do. Okay? St. Branch, I love you. We'll see you back here next week.